Welcome back to the channel. This is Sebastian's Cauldron. I'm Sebastian. This is part three of the Lost Minds of Fandelva starter set series. We're looking at part three of the adventure called Spider's Web. It's a sort of sandboxy kind of thing. There's five different quests from five different quest givers that are given to you. And we are gonna go through, talk about each one, my advice on each of them, as well as talking about one of the most hotly discussed topics of this adventure, which is the inclusion of a young green dragon for a fourth or third level party. So let's get right into it. So part three, like I said, is called Spider's Web. We are looking at the web of different things that the Black Spider and Phandalin have presented to you, your players, as adventures. We have five different quests from five different quest givers. Each of them are varying in difficulty and scope in what they're doing. A lot of them are combat focused, some are just role play, etc. There's a nice little mix of everything. All of these adventures, all these quest givers, we talked about in part 2A in my previous video. You can look at that up there if you want, but otherwise we're gonna get right into it talking about these different quests. So the quests are very handily summarized for you on page 27. Like I said, there are five of them. We have quests from Sister Gariel, Darren Edamath, Kelleen Alderleaf, Townmaster Harbin Wester, and of course, Silda Hall Winter. Each of them has some really interesting, cool, classic sort of D&D stuff in them. This is one of the reasons why this adventure is fantastic to start with. I'm gonna put timestamps over there. If you wanna to click to skip forward, or if you wanna rewatch a section or whatever it is that you want to do. Anyway, we're gonna start off first of all with Sister Gariel's quest. Sister Gariel, is a elven cleric of Timora, Timora, one of the two, who is the goddess of good fortune. And in a cruel twist of fate, she has come across some bad luck as she's been instructed with locating the spell book of an ancient mage. The ancient mage is given some fancy name. I think it's like a bow gentle, bow gentle or something weird like that. Cool, whatever. But Gariel is trying to find a banshee. Banshees are known for having access to information, answers to questions that many people dare not ask. Naturally, she is going to hope that the players will be able to find this Banshee for her and ask the question that she needs the answer to, the location of the spell book. Through that, she gives the players a jeweled silver comb as a token of gratitude, as a basically bribe and offering to this Banshee in hopes that it will take it and give the answer to the question that she needs answered. This has just reminded me while I'm struggling to sort of mentally remember the names, you might notice that Wizards of the Coast has really weird names for people. Uh, Gabrielle, Darren, Edamath, they're all sort of strange. I'm convinced that they do this to force the players to have to write down everything so that they, you know, actually remember. I don't, I don't know, conspiracy theory kind of thing. But anyway, the important thing being your players are gonna be encountering a Banshee. Cool. The encounter is meant to be creepy, it's meant to be eerie. The box text emphasizes the lone forest, the strangeness, the quiet, the darkness, and the banshee itself should be something that the players are either scared of or, you know, a little creeped out by. The banshee is found in the abandoned town of Coneyberry, uh, which really amps up the creepiness, and the players should be probably aware that a fight against the banshee is not gonna be a good idea. This encounter, in my opinion, is a fantastic one for teaching your players a very important lesson of D&D, which is your actions are always going to have consequences. As written in the adventure, if the players are rude, disrespectful, or threatening in any way to the Banshee, the Banshee disappears. Uh, that's like an automatic fail state for this quest, obviously, because the Banshee's not gonna reappear, because well, why, why would she? Now, this might annoy your players. It's a pretty quick fail state. You might want to have the Banshee give them a warning you know, and say something in the lines of, if you dare disrespect me once more, I shall not return. And then have them disappear. So you could do one of the two. If you're feeling really cruel, you could have the Banshee attack and TPK the party. I'm not gonna judge you for that if that's where things are going, but uh, you know, there's a different encounter for that a little later on. 
if they present the comb to the Banshee as an offering, the Banshee will immediately be persuaded and will give the answer to one question. Otherwise, if the players decide to not present the comb for whatever reason, if they want to keep it and sell it, the Banshee needs a sort of medium difficulty charisma persuasion check. Persuasion? Persuasion. You know what I'm trying to say. I'm pronouncing things weird today. Okay. As I said, the Banshee has a lot of knowledge. It can answer pretty much any question. It doesn't have to be about the spellbook. They could ask where Cragmore Castle is, where Wave Echo Cave is, where Gundren is, who the Black Spider is, all sorts of stuff, uh, which they might not necessarily be aware of, but if they become aware of it, that can potentially speed things up for you, the DM, a little quicker than you intended. So be prepared for that. Banshees are meant to know a lot of things and that can sort of derail things pretty quickly. They should be careful though, because the Banshee is going to answer one question and one question only. So they gotta be careful. Next up is Darren Edermarth's quest. Darren Edermarth is a half-elf retired adventurer that lives in the Edermarth Orchard. His quest is quite simple. He's become aware of some strange activity in the ruins of Old Owl Well. He explains that this was an ancient watchtower built by an ancient empire many, many, many years ago, and it might be harboring some dangerous and dormant magic. And so naturally he's concerned that something is going to go wrong or something bad is happening. Darren himself is a retired adventurer. He doesn't go out and do that sort of thing anymore. So naturally he will hire the adventurers to go and investigate, which is a shocking, shocking verb. Uh, Absolutely, I mean, Matt Cobble's done a video on verbs. I will reiterate what he said that investigate is awful because investigate presumes that the players know how to investigate. And not many people really do, save for, you know, in actual investigators. I would personally amp up the quest a little bit, have Darren say, go and find out what's happening and if something evil is there, take care of it. But that's a little, you know, quick on the murder, but if something evil is happening, you know, evil is evil. Uh, there are, of course, there are, of course, opportunities for roleplay, and when the players do get to Old Alwell, they will discover that there is an evil mage, capital E, capital M, who is presently residing in the Watchtower. He is a necromancer, his name is Haman Kost, Haman Kost, well, again, weird names, I, I don't know. He has an army of 12 zombies that he will use to attack the players, who might notice before they get to Old Alwell the scent of rotting flesh, necrotic matter, and general decay. Haman Kost is a little aggressive. He's very tight-lipped about what exactly it is that he is doing. He might give some information if he thinks the players can do something for him. He is looking for the name of the person who created the Watchtower, which is a question that the players could ask the Banshee if they felt so inclined. Or alternatively, he is hoping that maybe the players can get rid of the orcs at Wyvern Tor. So we're sort of seeding in our other adventures into this one as well, which is kind of handy to have. Of course, in the event of a fight, you're going up against a wizard as well as some zombies. There's some cool loot that's described in the adventure. It's a fun little side quest. Next is Townmaster Harbin Wester's quest. This is probably the simplest quest of them all. And it's actually, I think when I did it, I presented it on just like a job notice board, which I can't remember if that's how it is described in the adventure or not, but it is pretty simple. Go to X place to kill Y amount of creature. Cool. In this case, you have to go to Wyventor to take care of the orcs that are residing there. The orcs are obviously not good, so we gotta go and kill them. It, it's, it's as simple as that. There's really not much to it. There's no map included for this one or for the other two encounters that I just described. They're pretty simple. If you need something, you can quickly draw something or you can do it theater of the mind. I think the orcs in here would provide an interesting challenge purely because you know, they're similar to bugbears, they're big brutes, they hit hard, and they might pose a threat. There's also an ogre as well. So it's just a fun little combat encounter that you can throw at the players with, you know, a little bit of gold at the end. Next is Kelleen Alderleaf's quest. This is the big one. This is my favorite one. When I ran it for the first time, I was thrilled. It was super awesome. This is the dragon, this is Thunder Tree. For this one, we have a map. I'll put it, actually I'll, 
put it over there so you can see it a little better. Kaleen is a halfling that suggests that the players find Radoth the Druid. Radoth, who recently went to the ruins of Thunder Tree in order to do some magic investigation or something along those lines, knows the lay of the land pretty well and would probably be able to help the players find various locations, including Cragmore Castle, Wave Echo Cave, and so on. This is my favorite bit of Lost Minds of Phandelver in my opinion, but it's also a massive trap and you need to really think and prepare for it before you run it. So there's quite a few locations here. This is basically like an above ground dungeon. We've got various monsters. We've got ash zombies, twig blights, cultists, giant spiders, and the young green dragon. Because yeah. If you look at the starter set box cover, you'll notice that there is a green dragon on there that the characters are fighting. That's not just cool design, cool, you know, artwork to get you excited. They're hinting at, you know, this dragon encounter. So this is really cool. A DM's first dragon, a player's first dragon is a really exciting prospect. It is, you know, half of the game, dungeons and dragons. It's pretty important. You wanna make sure you run it right the first time. You need to prepare and be aware of several things. Firstly, this dragon is tough. It is dangerous. It could definitely wipe out the party without breaking too much of a sweat. Secondly, the adventure suggests that you fight the dragon, which promotes a level of action that I don't think is great to instill in your players as a habit because not every creature should be fought. Not every fight is winnable. This is not a video game where things are balanced precisely to the character's sort of levels of power. Thirdly, there is a group of dragon cultists here who in the event of a battle will come and join the fight on the side of the dragon. That's a death spiral if I've ever seen one. So let's talk about green dragons for a moment. According to the flavor text in the monster manual, green dragons are the most cunning, the most manipulative of all of the true dragons. They'll use misdirection and trickery to get an upper hand on their foes, on their enemies. They live in forests and marshes. They will often compete with black dragons for territory and they are generally pretty bad news. They are hunters, they are schemers, they will manipulate people into doing their bidding. They will have plans far, far, far ahead in place, thinking 20 steps ahead. Of course, that's sort of presuming, you know, slightly older dragons. This young green dragon, who is named Venom Fang, might not be as smart. That's okay, he is still going to be a big threat. I very much like the idea, and this is what I implemented when I ran Thunder Tree for my players the first time, of highlighting Venom Fang as a manipulator and getting him to get the players to further his own goals. The tower in Thunder Tree that he is using as a lair is commendable, it's nice, but it certainly could be bigger. And Venom Fang has just discovered something very interesting, a castle that has been recently inhabited by goblins and a bugbear. And he feels that it would be better suited for him and his lair rather than this pitiful little tower that he has. Naturally, in exchange for sparing the players' lives, at least for now, the players can go and clear out the castle for him. This conveniently is going to be Cragmore Castle, of course, which will be Sildar's quest, which we'll talk about in a sec. But it really highlights the, the manipulativeness, the sort of why would I do it when someone else could do it for me nature that you would imagine a green dragon to have, especially a young green dragon. This gives us some really interesting avenues for roleplay rather than just combat. Green dragons and dragons in general are really fun to role play. They are meant to be extremely intelligent as a DM. You can metagame and use your own knowledge. You can try, if you know your play as well, try and manipulate them and try and get them to, you know, maybe get onto your side or get them to turn on each other, create some infighting within the group, which is always fun in a healthy dose, that is. Of course, if the players do fight Venom Fang, they are in for a treat. Its poison breath is going to do a lot of damage, which it will probably use on its first round. Its fly speed means it can move around quite quickly. Its to hit modifiers for its attacks are quite high, which means it's going to be doing a lot of damage. According to the not great 
CR challenge rating system that D&D 5th edition uses. This is a CR 8 creature, which means a group of four level 8 adventurers would be able to take this thing on in a fair and balanced fight. In reality, the action economy is going to mean that your players will probably stand a bit more of a chance, especially if you have a larger group of four or more players. The adventure suggests that if the dragon is reduced to half hit points or fewer, it flees, going to find a different lair, which sort of makes sense. Venom Fang's horde is not as large as some other dragon hordes would be, and it probably values, you know, creatures that it's manipulated and do its bidding for them a little more than, you know, a few bits of treasure. So it sort of makes sense, I guess. And if the dragon retreats, of course, it's going to remember the players. It's a rival a sort of enemy that can come back later on and really bite the players in the ass. So like I said, this is a really interesting dragon encounter. It requires a bit of work from you. I'm sort of surprised that they included this in the game. I, I understand why they did it. Dragons are of course important in D&D. However, you are going to have to do a little bit of work thinking of how you want to implement the dragon. There's a lot of really cool and interesting resources online, especially in Reddit, that you can look up to find for, you know, role-playing dragons, for think different things that people have done with Venom Fang. There's some really cool solutions out there, which I highly recommend you go and check out. The general setup of the dragon in the sort of tower is a really good sort of archetype to use. It's something that I ended up using when I had to improvise a dragon hunt for one of the first few sessions of the chain campaign, sort of the tribute to Matt Cobble's The Chain that I did, where they got a job to hunt down a dragon and I didn't have anything prepped and I was able to sort of remember Thunder Tree and remember this sort of layout and, you know, quickly whipped it up and it was a very memorable encounter. We still talk about it to this day. This was like got a year and a half ago at this stage, so it's pretty cool. You just gotta do a bit of work. And finally, last but not least, we have Sildar Hall Winter's Quest. This is Cragmore Castle, which is part three's version of part one's Cragmore Hideout. Except there's more goblins, there's some hobgoblins as well, there's an owlbear, awesome, and there's also, you know, more bugbears, etc. It's basically a high level version of the previous one. One of the more interesting enemies that appears here is a doppelganger disguised as a female drow who was said to be a messenger from the black spider. That's sort of cool. Oh, I'll put a map up there, by the way. I forgot to do that. The doppelganger spy is kind of cool to have, but it's sort of lazy and thrown in out of nowhere. There's no setup for it. If you watch my part two A video, which I'll put back up there, uh, you might remember me talking about including some hints to the Black Spider and their spies. You could perhaps, if you've done something like that, have this doppelganger take on the appearance of one of the spies that the players spotted. That gives you some narrative consistency that'll make them think, oh, we've seen this person before. Connect the dots. That makes sense. If you want to go one step further, perhaps a particularly sneaky character who's able to listen in on a conversation between the doppelganger and King Grohl might overhear the doppelganger describing the party and describing the meddling in their affairs. Other than that, this is a pretty standard dungeon. There's enemies to fight, things to kill, loot to be found. We also find Gundren Rockseeker, the man who hired everybody, man, dwarf, you know what I mean, and his map to Wave Echo Cave. This is sort of the main quest uh, plot that we are following through for this adventure, Lost Minds of Fandelver. And that's what we have for part three, five quests. One of them is the main thing, the others are sort of interesting side quests, but that's the whole of part three. Now, this might sound like a lot. All of this you could wrap up in probably two sessions, maybe three. You also don't need to use all of this. You can skip content, you can add stuff on, you can make the orcs at Wyventor more relevant. Perhaps they are the signs of a roving orc war band that is gonna come maybe when the player's at level five or something. That actually would be a really good sort of tie-in. You can make them white tusk orcs if you wanna use strongholds and followers. That could be something interesting. The adventure also includes some overland travel mechanics for random encounters if you, you know, feel the need to include that. It's a very particular type 
of game that uses random encounters, I'm personally not a fan. I think you pretty quickly will decide if you like them or not. There is something nice about the randomness of, you know, travel is dangerous and you want to show that by having encounters. But personally, I prefer writing out sort of travel encounters, things that would make sense, that would either further some sort of plot, the A plot or the B plot, or just sort of be something interesting rather than just rolling a dice and saying, oh, it's wolves today. Cool. Of course, the random encounter tables, they're good sources of inspiration. If you're not sure what should appear, or if you want something a little interesting, but you can't think off the top of your head of what you should include. Now, as I always say in these videos, this is not a replacement for the adventure. You should have the adventure. You should be reading it, having a look. It includes a lot more detail. You've got the beautiful maps and everything that you can look at. You can make notes in the margins. You can type them up. You can handwrite whatever it is. Whatever your process is, you can do it. So that is part three. You can use as much of that as you want or as little as you want. Modules, as I have said in the video up there, are a framework for you to build your own stories off of. If you get through Lost Minds of Fandelva and you missed all of this stuff because the player started doing something else, that's okay. That is the beauty and nature of modules. They will become your own and become wholly personal to you and your group because no, no, no game is gonna be the same. Things are gonna be different. Priorities will shift and change and it will become something wholly unique to your party. And that is, I think, amazing. So that is the video. I'm probably not going to look at part four, Wave Echo Cave. That is because I didn't run it personally when I did Lost Minds of Fandelva. I did my own weird homebrew ending, which I wasn't particularly happy with in hindsight, but you know, it was a new DM, that's fine. But I don't want to give advice on that because I haven't run it personally. And you know, it's just a big dungeon crawl. It's just a bigger version of Cragmore Castle or of Thunder Tree. There's weird and wacky creatures in there. There's the black spider themselves. But aside from that, I feel like you don't really need advice. You sort of just, you read through it, you prepare it, and then you put your players through it. Easy. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have anything that you would like to see from me in the near future, any types of videos or anything, please put that in the comments below. Hopefully we can do some campaign diaries again when we start playing. I'm predicting probably in a couple of weeks, three or four weeks, maybe a month at the most, we will see. You can check out my other videos that I've been doing. My Iron Man one, like I say, is very popular. And you can check out my Firearms and Fantasy series, which I think is really cool. And I'll see you guys some other time.